coming. We're not going to delve too deep into some things. If you've got some really, you know, specific technical questions, I'm happy to go into that a little bit later. But mostly what I want to talk about is what Intel has been up to for the last you know, three and a half years when we are going to be doing it in the next year and a half. Fundamentally, as our as our CEO described it, is we're we're we're, we're building uh, five nodes in four years. So everybody knows what four years is, right? When you count, we know what minutes five plus the right? But uh, does anybody know what I mean when I say five nodes? Anybody not know what I mean when I say yeah. five nodes? Okay, I at least one. And so back back in the Stone Age, when dinosaurs <coughs> ruled the world or something like that, Intel used to talk about this thing that they called TikTok. And in TikTok, what we would do is we would create a, a design for a CPU, and we call that a mask. Then, by the way, the design sort of like a a blueprint, and called a mask because that's what it did: shine right through it, and it masks certain areas out. And and we would we would get that correct, and we would put it in one of our manufacturing plants, and a chip would come out. And that was what we called a tick. And then what would happen is we would build a new manufacturing plant at a at a smaller technology, smaller architecture. And we would take that exact same map and display it over here on the new plant. And we called that a plot. So we had the same architecture, going now smaller now. That gave us some advantages along the way. We did that for a variety of reasons. We did that fundamentally because the old engineering adage is you only change one thing at a time. Because then if it breaks, you know where to look for your fix. Um, we abandoned that probably about 20 years ago or so. And 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 those talk things that I spoke of were now what we call a node. So we took 45 nanometers or whatever that was, and we shrunk it down to, to 20 nanometers. So that was a node. That was a change of the node. So 45 nanometers. Um, around 2015 or so, we got kind of stuck at 14 nanometers. So if you actually go back to the architecture, you'll find that, um, that we did 14 nanometers, and then we did 14 nanometers plus, and then we did 14 nanometers plus plus, and then we did 14 nanometers advanced, and then we did 14 nanometers with another one's problem. We were stuck there for a while. And that created some problems for us, not just on the technical side of things, because people began to question whether or not we were keeping up with Moore's Law, but it gave an opportunity for, we have competition. It gave an opportunity for our competition to come into some space that we really didn't want them to be into. Let me see if now that changed up. So we've been on this journey. It tells, um, you know, 50 plus, about the same age, actually, UT Dallas. What, what, what's UT Dallas? Like 1968? 1969. So we're a year older than UT Dallas. But here's where it all began. And then we're finally out here somewhere. And that problem that I, that I spoke to came in right around this, this time frame along the way. Um, and by the way, when I speak about our, our CPUs, I typically put it into um, what I like to call light rock and heavy metal. And for those of you who don't know anything in manufacturing CPUs, you use heavy metal in making these things, right? But um, so around this time frame, the Intel Xeon processor was was introduced. This is the large scale, the heavy metal. This is what goes into the data center. The CPU that might be in some of these laptops around here is based on the stuff that sits on that side. It's the light rock. But nevertheless, it goes to the same manufacturing process if those masks are significantly more complex and different. And uh, we used some similar architecture in the actual cores themselves, but uh, the 40% of the interconnect that, that takes place and then some of the acceleration is significantly different when we go from light rock into the heavy metal space. But here we are out here, and we're working on now this thing that we call IDM 2.0. Before all of this was IDM 1.0, and that is the manufacturing process that we speak to, taking those masks and, and all the things that go along with it to produce the CPUs. And we realized that that was one of the things that got us stuck in that technology where we did 14 nanometer and then all those pluses in that time frame. So you know, also what happened is in the time, inside this time frame is that uh, anybody here in the business school, we were being run by finance people, not engineers. So the finance people kept wanting to squeeze harder and harder and harder. And we lost our engineering edge. We kicked those finance people to the curb from our CEO and brought an engineer back in. So, so now we have an engineer running the company. He came back and said, look, in order to, in order to revitalize this, we've got to look at the technical problems. We just can't look at the finance parts of things. So looking at those technical problems, he said, here's where you're broke. You're broke and that you tried, tried to squeeze all of the smart stuff out of it and you were just milking the, milking the machine. If you will. And that allowed our competition to come. In. So he introduced this thing called IDM 2.0 where we're reinvigorating 
our engineering design, and this thing that we call internally um, five nodes in four years. Sometimes if you see it out in the press, we abbreviate that because that's what we do at Intel. We own the rights globally or maybe universally to abbreviate anything, anything that we architecture, you know, we're going to stick an acronym on it. So it, it's five N four Y. And where we are today is we're actually shipping now, I was talking about we were stuck at 14 nanometers. We're actually shipping product at four nanometers. So the guy came in two and a half years ago and now we've gone from 14 all the way down to four nanometers. That's the introduction. There's still a lot of seven nanometer being out, out there. This, um, this is manufacturing ready all, already, and we're actually we're actually testing silicon now at both 20 angstrom and 18 angstrom. Anybody know what an angstrom is? Somebody knows what an angstrom is. Anybody else know what an angstrom is? 10 to the minus 10 meters. Anybody have idea? Any idea what the scale of that is? I don't. Okay, I was I was looking it up, and I, I couldn't do the thing. Um, so uh, a sodium atom, again. Sodium atom, it's a pretty good size atom, is about is about one angstrom. So it's 18 sodium atoms. We're getting really, really close to, to atomic scale when we start looking at things in the 18A. And this is like I said, we're getting chips out of this. They're not they're not in uh, production quality or production volumes yet, um, but we we have we have cell phones coming out. So give you some idea of where we've come from and where we're going to, and, and there's more beyond that. Um, so maybe maybe you guys do know. You know the name Intel and the word, and obviously everybody sort of stops at, at the computers. You know we we take credit, and by we I'm taking credit for something I didn't do. Um, we take we take credit for for the mass production of semiconductors who have changed who have changed the world. Um, but in addition to that, in the last two decades, two decades and a half, um, the industries themselves have realized that well, we've gone from these standalones to where connectivity is really central. And significant. And again, that's the space that I like to play in because everything really is connected today. You know, I don't know if you were watching as we were fussing around and I'm saying, okay, Ed wanted to record this session, but I had to go online and get the code for this and the code for that. And when I get in, I pulled out my phone and pulled them all together. 30 years ago, that would have been impossible. I know you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. That Stone Age type of stuff. But that, that would have been totally impossible. One of the big issues that we're facing today inside the industry is the fact that about 80% of the data that is produced for interesting purposes, does what we call falls on the floor today. Is that there are no compute resources or there's no capacity inside the network itself to bring that information to a point that is accessible. So one of the key areas that we're working on at Intel is uh, cloud edge infrastructure. And then obviously uh, artificial intelligence is, is the buzzword du jour. Although um, uh, someone in this audience knows I was probably working on artificial intelligence. We didn't call it that, called artificial neural networks about 35 years ago. But now we have the compute resources, we have the memory, we have the capacity. The algorithms actually haven't changed very much, but we can actually get them to convert. We've got the ability uh, to get those algorithms to convert, convert by putting that data in. 70 billion data points or something like that in order to get the algorithms converge. And then ultimately, sensing. And one of the things we like to talk about in that area is that the, is video is the ultimate sensor in there. So one of the things we're also doing in the, um, in that um, pervasive connectivity is ingesting that, that video information and making it consumable so it doesn't fall on the floor for useful purposes. All right. Um, this may sound a little bit like a like a sales pitch and it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean to do that if I really am an engineer not a sales guy, even though that's you know that thing. Um, in our product leadership area, you know, clearly on client computing. How many of you guys have heard of a newly introduced AI PC? Yeah, one or two. Um, it's kind of a cool thing. So again, there's so much more into the architecture of what's happening now. Is now we have neural network processors, NPUs, as they call them, that are part of that light rock. We have to change that out, um, that, that analogy pretty soon. That's showing up in that next generation of PCs. So you'll be able to do a lot of inferencing on your on your machine uh, very effectively. Um, and what I mean by effective is that because of of all this information that's flowing, believe it or not, power is becoming more and more of a concern. <laughs> Not just the power, but I've got to do power. When we start looking at the amount of, of energy that is consumed by what we call the ICT industry, is it consumes anywhere between three and a half to four percent of the amount of global energy that's being produced in the world today. And that's a lot because it's actually the largest industry that's consuming energy in that space. So when we start talking about things that we do on the heavy metal side of the world, the things that we're putting into our technology today need to be very power sensitive. Um, if any of you have heard me speak before about the you know, transition between 4G and 5G, I talk about the exponential increase in the volume of traffic that's flowing through the network. And one of the CEOs that I speak with um, says that uh, 
that for every bit of traffic that flows through his network, there's a finite amount of energy required in order to do that. So if you suddenly think about, so one comp service provider here in the United States, won't go by the name, um, spends about $10 billion a year today in, in real dollars paying for the electricity bill just to operate their 5G and 4G mobile network. $10 billion a year upon that energy company. If two years from now, the event, and, and there's a fixed amount of energy moving every bit through their network, right? So hang on to that. If, if two years from now, because of that exponential curve, the volume of traffic that's going through there, we go from 5G to 5G plus, if that doubles, they certainly don't want to be paying $20 billion a year for the energy that goes into their network. So one of the things that we're spending a lot of time at, at Intel is working on that, that power consumption that goes into these devices so that we can continue to increase, not just at the rate of Moore's law from a technology standpoint, but also from a power standpoint. So there are power savings features that are going onto the designs. But that implied that, we, that we're doing things in the algorithms then, because the chip itself is, is capable of it is, it's, it needs to be intelligent from that standpoint. So from a software standpoint, we're doing things to enable it so that, so that the amount of traffic, uh, we can use algorithms to, to track the hysteresis and on a, a handful of nanosecond by nanosecond basis react to that that traffic because there's a, again there's a fixed amount of energy in order to put that chip into a lower power state when there's no traffic and there's a fixed amount of energy to pull it back out and that amount of energy in and that amount of energy out has to more than compensate for the energy saving so you have to have uh, an energy saving so there's something to do with it um this slide is outdated this gap needs to be filled if um if for those of you that are in the business section and even if you're an engineer i encourage you to understand the numbers of financial companies look at or will eventually be working for um, but we report out as it is today um, five different um, areas from a financial standpoint and soon there will be a sixth of the one that's missing here is actually being reported out right now um, this is like rock this is this is our client chip this is the one you can find in the um the, the laptops and helping tell the cii this is the heavy metal um, that i spoke to that's where the zeons belong and and some other things as well um, the AS, 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 so they're kind of cool. Those actually are actually going to the radio access network itself, but they're somewhat programmable. The radio access, you know, 4G, 5G network out there. Okay. And then when um, when I talked about the connectivity aspect of things, this is an emerging organization called NEX. Mobileye, this is an acquisition that, uh, that we made several years ago, and it's um, it, it, it's using sensors for well, things like autonomous driving. So there was a note on there about sensors. The one that's missing right now is actually just carved out from PCAI on January 1st. And you'll notice that those Agile, so those are, that's our uh, FPGA, FPGA unit. So that now is going back um, to the name Altera and um, it's going to be called out as Tucker p and and we're on record now to actually spin off part of that. So we're gonna IPO a portion of it and maybe 5% or 20% uh, whatever that number happens to be. And then finally, I talked about IDM 2.0 and some of the problems. We didn't kick all the finance people on the curb. We kept a couple of smart ones around. And one of the things that they looked at was the way we internally structure our accounting and our manufacturing process. So that's you know, when I'm talking about the six inch chalk, so those fabs that we've got factories that we have where we actually take those masks and create the silicon. Um, used to be a cost center to these guys. And because you were a cost center to those guys, these guys could create IDM 1.0, a lot of machinery that they simply push the cost back to internally into these two organizations. And they realized that these guys weren't being as economically aware maybe as they needed to be. And I'm not saying that they were bloated. They're just not economically aware because they didn't have to be. Whatever the cost was, they just added 20% to it and charged the other business units, as we called them. So what's going to happen very soon, it's already out there. There's a, there's an 8K filing out there. that uh, What we call Intel Founder Services, or IFS, is being separated as a separate P&L. So now these guys will have accountability. So the factory itself, if their manufacturing process goes a little wonky and they start throwing chips away, they have to eat it instead of these guys having to eat it from that standpoint. Why would we do that? One of the reasons we would do that is, um, again, in this greater vision of things, our competition, anybody here of AMD? <laughs> yeah, anybody know how many factories AMD has to manufacture silicon? Zero. <laughs> Where's your silicon come from? TSMC. This is Intel's version of TSMC now. We're going to actually, you know, a year ago, I would have said it this way. Every chip that comes out of an Intel factory has an Intel brand on it. A year ago, I would have said that. Not every chip that comes as an Intel brand on it came out of an Intel factory. Does understand the Venn diagram? 
Did I describe it? So soon, there will be chips coming out of Intel factories that do not have the Intel printer. We're going to start manufacturing silicon for other other folks. I don't think we'll ever manufacture silicon for AMD. It's likely that we'll manufacture silicon for somebody like ARM. You guys remember the ARM CPU? It's likely we'll start manufacturing silicon for somebody like NVIDIA. It's likely we'll start manufacturing silicon maybe for somebody like Qualcomm or Apple. I don't know. Those are all very, yeah, and, and there's others. You know, there's some others that are placed. But we're, we're carving that out. And it's a separate P&L. We can build a firewall between them then. So from an architectural design standpoint, this entity can exist. And if we create something really cool and great over here, it's not going to leak across to our competition. Similarly, if our competition creates something, Qualcomm, for example, um, in, in in the radio network, it's not going to leak across to our EASIC design. So that's one of the cool things that I think we've been up to. So um, that's what we're talking about. So I mentioned five nodes in four years. And um, you know, this is where we are today. Um, and I, I already told you about 18A, 20A, and 18A. And we're actually working on on the next the next two of these. If any of you were here a year ago or so, I spoke about the Intel foundries themselves, the factories that we were building. Um, we're in the process of building yeah, about two new factories each. I mean, factory. They're going to be owned by IFS. Um, any guess at what it costs us to build a factory? Billion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cost us cost us a billion dollars just to pour the concrete. <laughs> Seriously, from the time we start pushing dirt until we have the shell, nothing inside it except just the concrete. Well, maybe some conduit. It's a billion dollars. The equipment and get it operational is about another nine billion dollars. So we're spending about twenty billion dollars a year building these factories. Timeline-wise, takes us four to five years to build a new factory. So in order to move from, and, and each one of these, by the way, is a factor, right? You know, we don't, the way the technology works is that once you've built, you know, a, a 10 nanometer factory, that remains a 10 nanometer factory for its life from an equipment standpoint. Now, we do have cases where we can decommission them, pull all the equipment out, and roll new equipment in. But that takes even longer, actually, than building a new factory, and it costs a little bit more. So oftentimes, we build the factory we're building. We have enough land right now. In Ohio to build 10 new factories. So just east of, uh, if we once moved to Ohio, lovely weather there. <laughs> Three days in August. Um, but anyway, we're 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 on record building two new factories in Ohio, uh, building one in in New Mexico, building one in Oregon. Those are our main operations in the U.S. Um, Ireland has one. Um, in addition to the, the factories themselves, so everybody has an idea. You know, you see, you see the big wafers, right? You know, the shy, they won't give me one. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> These things are like a million dollar piece or something like that. So when you see our executives holding them up, you can believe that's a dead wafer, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but but in any case, um, once we once we do that, at the end of the factory assembly line, we've got machines that cut those into into the chips themselves. But then those chips end up having to go inside packaging. It's going to get leads out of them all. We don't do that at this factory when I'm speaking, but it would trick them someplace else. So even if that came out of a factory in New Mexico, those chips may get bundled up and shipped to Ireland. And Ireland is where we actually take and package them together and put the leads on it. There's a bazillion tests that get run on all of these things and two bazillion photographs of the chip, of each individual chip itself. So that we, again, it goes back to managing and processing our quality control. But that's also one of the one of the elements that we're going to be able to sell in our IFS is the manufacturing process itself. Because when you look at the actual cost of the of getting a consumable chip itself, so whether that's in a pin package or whether that's meant to be uh, soldered down, um, nearly half of that manufacturing cost actually is is post manufacture is, is, is post production itself in itself. It's the testing, it's the packaging, it's the validation, it's the traceability of all those elements themselves. So, and again, that's another area that we're looking at. So this is where this is where we're headed. Um, I don't get paid unless I say Moore's law three times. So I've said it twice yet. I need to say it one more time. Moore's law is not dead. Um, hopefully you guys have heard what it is. Um, it's clearly not a law, it's a motivation it's, as much as anything else was. It's the it's the thing that drives us to continually drive technology forward at an ever-increasing pace. Um, and and we still believe it. 
So as our CEO says, Moore's law doesn't die until we've exhausted the periodic table. I don't think we're going to start using radioactive materials anytime soon in our chips, but we've got a little ways to go. Thank you. Uh, um, all right. Where do we think it ends? I don't know. You know, we're out here now when we look at the density of devices. There are there are literally billions and billions of of semi of, of transistors on on the device today, and we think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be able to get it out before here. And from my standpoint, when I sit here looking at my career, that's gonna give me enough time to uh, maybe we have some rest. Um, not a whole lot there. We talk a little bit more about uh, about technological advancement. So it's it's so much in the early days. It really was about what I said before. We were just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking by um, changing the technology from a masking standpoint. We've bumped into a couple of founders. One of them is that, um, so when we think about the transistors themselves and the layers that are, that are built up, it's really easy to think about it as being just, you know, just a couple of layers. Right? You've, got, you've got your substrate and then, you know, an N layer and a P layer and you integrate them together and that's the case. But today's technology is that okay, so we're producing the 20 nanometers. Um, there are up to 17 layers in the heavy metal device system. Last book of now that start building. Anybody have an idea how long it takes us to go from a blank wafer to one of those chips at the end of the factory? A week? Yeah, how, yeah, how quick Toyota can produce a car from raw material to the end of the assembly line? It takes about three days. And they can produce a car about every two and a half minutes or something like that. So when we take by the way, we don't make those blank bits, right? We buy those from somebody else. There's only like one source of 90% of those blank bits put in oil. This should scare you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are they this, in the States? This should, this should scare No, they are not. Right? Yeah, it's the scary um, part. Well, this is one of the problems that we ran into in COVID. But that's another story for another time. Um, so, so for the time it takes us to push a blank disk through our factory until we get a chip out the back end, the manufactured chip out the back end, is... Um, about three months. It's a long time to do that. Um, and and then you, you want to think about what I spoke of is to let it, the chip's not ready to be consumed yet. Then it's got to go through all that packaging and sort of stuff. So there's a lot of latency in here. And that kind of goes back to what I was speaking about, about cost in, in that old architectures. Those folks didn't care because they didn't have to bear any of that cost, but now they do. But where I was really wanted to go with that was I was talking about the, the number of layers that are in there. So in those that heavy metal stuff that I spoke of, there can be up to 17 layers now above the substrate. So the etching itself, and you know, there's a whole lot of technology that goes on to that. You know, you've got to bake it and let it dry and spin it out again. Um, there could be up to 17 layers that are in there, but you still have to interconnect. You have to interconnect these devices for power, and you also have to interconnect them for signal. So Intel has come up with this thing that we now call Power Via. That's kind of cool because we've always talked about the old B as a printer made up. Um, a piece of glass from a circuit board, you have via holes that are in there. But this power via technology allows us to get more energy deeper into the chip and pull the heat out of that deep part of the chip because heat is the enemy of, of silicon in this area. Um, but this is actually one of the things that was most significant that allowed us to go from, from our three. Um, by the way, this is uh, this is equivalent to about 30 angstroms, by the way. So we want nanometers. Um, as we get smaller, you know, start getting into 1.5s or something like that. So from uh, about the 30 angst from here to the 20 angst from here, is we had to come up with this new technology. And again, it's, it's what allows us to continue the process of the law uh, to, you know, to, to provide power into those devices to keep that smaller and smaller. So that's an area that, um, that the, um, not the electricals, not the chemicals, um, but actually the mechanical engineers get involved in, you know, in our design area. Um, so I talked about packaging, and um, this just takes you through some of the packaging that, that, that's going on now. And I guess in the timeline standpoint, we're out here. Um, we talk about the yield of the semiconductors themselves, and um, we're bumping up into a problem that um, we've made the dyes geometrically, not not architecturally from a from a uh, substrate, but um, the dyes are about as big as they can. Now, so when I talk about a, a Z on itself. The Xeon die that's coming out is is about yay big at the highest end. So we only make we have about 56 CPUs in our Xeon roadmap, but there are only three masks that go through this manufacturing process. We only have three architectures that come through there. 56 come out, 
um, the largest ones about day big from the high mass, what we call the extreme core count. And the reason we have all of those in there is there are defects, right? None of this stuff is pure. And as we identify defects, we fuse those areas off. There's a lot of redundancy built into our architecture today. And we fuse them off. By fuse them off, I mean, we'll fuse. So instead of having a 56 core part, if we find a couple of defects, we'll blow some of those cores off. And maybe it ends up being a 48 core part from that, even though it came from the mass that produces 56. Right? So when you start looking at the, at the yield curve, that also drives the cost factor because it, it, what costs you money is the size of the die um, that comes out at the end of the day, not the number of cores that are working on that die itself. But then, but then what's happening is that I talked about I.O. And um, in those dies themselves, they, in the high-end architecture, only about 40% of that die is actually what we call the CPU portions, the um, cores themselves. Another 40% is the stuff that's marshaling traffic in and out, uh, doing the I.O., ensuring that we've got thermals that are being maintained, and that power stuff that I was talking about, so we can actually change the frequency rate of the cores individually and put them into sleep, cause them to safe state, pull their state out, and all that, without software being aware that's happening. But one of the things that we're starting to do now is that we're re-architecting those so that we aren't trying to make bigger and bigger dies. We're going to take some of that I.O. actually and put it on um, an SOC. It's, uh, silicon is a... Um, Silicon is the chip architecture. Sometimes they call that tiled architecture themselves. So the, the PCI interfaces, for example, we've got 64 PCI interfaces. Those interfaces may in fact be on a separate chip so that we can now start making our dies smaller instead of bigger as we add more and more interfaces along the way. But what that does is that puts more pressure on our packaging because that doesn't come out of the factory that way. So we can actually have, for example, a three nanometer PCIe collection of interfaces and a, a 20 angstrom CPU architecture itself. And we bring those together at the packaging area. Um, so it allows us to, to continue to move forward from that modular standpoint. And again, this is, this is all good for the side. Okay. So of course. About photonics. I, I don't have a slide that talks to that on the connectivity side of things. I can I can address it right now if you'd like, or is there something specific you're after? I've heard the future of getting the past. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. I, th I think I hear two things. So, um, so first of all, let me take a bowl of water for Kate. Yes, Kate. Right. <laughs> Now, since we've got the question, I'm happy to handle it. So um, Intel does have a technology that, um, that is the photonics. And um, I like to say it's the, it's the type of thing that someone could actually get a Nobel Prize for. Is that if, ever, if, if you've ever looked at um, the fiber optic connections to an Ethernet, oftentimes you'll have uh, an SFP. It will be a separate little work of some sort. And sometimes there are QSFPs. They've got lots of different letters depending on their architecture themselves. But basically what this device does is it takes the electrical signal that exists on, on the network card and, and turns it into an optical signal in that direction or an optical signal in this direction and turns it into an electrical signal. And it's a separate device. Separate device for a number of reasons. One of them is because the technology of building the laser itself and, and then the, the diode, the photodiode that protects the photons and turns it back into the electrical signal is a different technology than the stuff that I spoke of over here in our manufacturer. So they're separate devices. Um, these devices and um, come in a variety of power ranges also, depending on how far you need to drive the signal. So if you're sitting in a data center and you've got a and you've got a computer that you want to connect to a router or a switch and it's at the end of a rack, right? So you're less than hundred meters away. So these devices themselves will operate in a uh, sub one watt range. But if you're if you're sitting there and you're on a ring interface in a metropolitan area, you may need to drive that 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 photo optics, uh, you know, 10 kilometers or more in some cases. And because of that, then that SFP itself is a different device. It may consume up to four to seven watts or something like that. And that can make a lot of difference. In remember, I said one of the problems with silicon is heat is its enemy. Well, when I talk about power consumption, I'm talking about generation of heat. That when we do that, so so you don't use the same SFP in a data center that you use when you're in that fiber optical range. But if you're in a data center and you've got 10,000 computers that are in there and each of these has four of these interfaces because we have um, 
the ability to handle that much traffic now on the CPU comp, uh, compute, you, you may actually have close to 50,000 of these SFPs in a data center. Um, one of the leading failures of devices in those data centers is dust getting into the fiber optic database. A little bit of dust gets between the connector right there. No matter how tight you want to seal that. And what do you have to do in order to recover that? Is you've got to send a human being and they've got to find it, they've got to find the right cable, they've got the little can of air spray, and they've got to. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We used to track this when I was with the uh, operator, and this was one of our leading failures for interfaces slapping. Well, Intel about five years ago um, developed and patented a, a, an ability that now allows us over here to manufacture those um, those detectable diodes themselves, and also the laser generation as part of the system. So when we manufacture a, a network interface card, now we can actually embed in the silicon itself. All of the technology that is the SFP, so you eliminate that. So you can actually now connect the fiber itself directly into the network interface card, eliminate one of the points of failure. Um, it applies mostly to very large data centers. So you want to think, you know, you want to think Microsoft, you want to think AWS, you know, Alibaba. Those are the people who are starting to consume that. Um, but this is the kind of stuff, actually, and I, I kid you not, that uh, is Nobel Prize worthy in the sense of, from a physics standpoint, it was a big physics problem. Figure out how to manufacture those devices over here in the technology. Um, I, I think that's one of the areas. The other one is, are we going to replace silicon with, with fiber itself on the internet? Um, oh boy, it was probably close to 40 years ago. Right, right, no, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so from a computational standpoint, optical computation, there was an article on that I we published um, probably close to 40 years ago that they were working on that, and I'm sure that there's still some people working on that. Yeah, it, it is right. Yeah, it is right. just like six good numbers in a lot. No, I, I, I do, I do know that they're working on that. Um, it, it's not an area that I see. Um, I'm willing to be wrong, but I don't see it becoming commercial viable for. Significant period of time. There's still a long way to go before we can actually compute with optics um, inside themselves. Um, but there are other interesting problems, like I said, replacing the SFP is a big one, um, by the way, for the data centers, not for like the roads. Another question, yeah? Well, so what I was talking about, dies. And tiles, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're starting to we're starting to package some of that up now in the 20 nanometer room. We're actually starting to do that. We're not we're not going to the point um, that that some of our competition does, where they actually take light rock compute cores themselves and tile those together. Um, that actually creates an architectural problem. You can be memory bound and I/O bound, and you can have uncontrollable latency and jitter. In that architecture, we don't do that. We've got a full mesh architecture on on the silicon die itself that has all of our cores. So we're not we're not going to go to that because we know we know what works in 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 the heavy metal space. But we will separate the I/O um, to begin with, and we'll separate GPU to begin with. So those will start going up in um, in tiled architecture. Yeah, good question. If we're talking about all this, I go back a little bit. So we both do, Jim. So that's, that's okay. It, uh, we're all familiar with the AI used to be the only Yeah. Back in the day, USB functionality could have been done over the shell computer. There were a couple things there. Yeah. Go on. So my, my question yeah. is we talked about these cores and stuff. Yeah. How do you, how do you, if you're talking about I/O and the cores, it seems like there's also things like communications functions or VSP oriented, and these things have certain functionalities. Yeah. Do you, you need to have certain. So a couple of things back in that back in that era, right? Um, and this goes back to probably I'm going to say the early to mid '80s in some sense. We had we had three fundamental competing architectures. Uh, we had the complex instruction set, which meant Intel. We had the risk instruction set, which eventually meant um, Solaris, the sun, the sun chip. And then we had DSPs. And um, if I take the, the latter two first, so the risk and the DSPs had one thing in common, and that is that they were able to execute, again, this is you know, almost four decades ago now, folks. Um, they were able to execute a single opcode per pick of the clock. This was 
what you this is what the essence of the definition of risk architecture and DSP did this for a different reason. They did not have risk, they did this for a different reason. And now the DSPs themselves, also in their architecture, um, they had they had two fundamental elements. They had they had floating point DSPs and they had integer DSPs in, in the institution, you shall never cross. So if you wanted to do floating point math on the integer on the DSP, you'd have to do a lot of work to do that. And then um, the floating point was really good at floating point. They were fundamentally what made them a digital signal processor was that they had an opcode in them that was the multiplied accumulated opcode in Xiaomi. If you looked at a lot of um, filter algorithms, you had, you know, n minus one plus something or another equals n. And that's a multiplied accumulated thing. And the DSP in their self in themselves, rather than 32 to floating point or 32 to integer, had the ability to do that, multiply and accumulate in one particular block. And that was what gave predictability to those algorithms were necessary because it was time sensitive. Yeah, yeah, you still do it today, right? So, how does that get into So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I just want to lay the foundation for that. And then you had the complex instruction set architecture. And if you went back into the early 80s and you looked at, at the, the dead tree kind of stuff that Intel published and you looked at our instruction set architecture, you would find that they, they told you the number of clocks each instruction would use. A move instruction used four clocks. A mall instruction, if it was integer, used eight clocks. If it was floating point, you didn't have the coprocessor, it used 32 clocks or whatever it was. Is it told you that? And there was this grand debate that took place amongst the theoretical computer scientists at the time, the university PhDs. And again, you can find this research somewhere, I think, if you look at the right stone tablets, that, um, um, that, that claim that risk architecture was superior to CISP because of a variety of reasons. And Intel fought like hell against that. And, and, and a nanosecond later after we were fighting against it, if you look at what happens today inside the Intel architecture, well, we've not changed, we've added two, but we've not changed any of our instructions to go back to that 8080 was in there. We changed them at the 8008 and certainly at 404, but 8080. The instruction set was fixed, and everything that you could do in the 8080 instruction set architecture in the ISA still exists today. One of the things that happens in our CPUs is the first thing that happens now is that when that opcode gets down inside the pipeline to the decode level, we turn it into a risk instruction, and we've been doing that for almost 30 years. So if you look at our if you look at our data today, we don't tell you how many clocks of the tick it takes to do any instruction, and there's a reason for that. We don't know is it depends on many things. The pipelines are so deep and they're so varied and we have abilities of doing pre-calculations on some things and sometimes stuff will through it and we don't need to calculate it because we've already got it earlier in the pipeline. That's the result when it gets to that. That's the result I want. We've already got it, right? In addition, what we've done over the generations is we've taken things like that multiplying and simulated many, many, many more. But we've actually made them native operations. So now you can do that in our architecture as well, and, and so the, the, and the DSPs died, and the DSPs died almost 20 years ago. Yeah, I got out of that business yeah, because yeah. now you can do in 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 IA, what we call the Intel architecture, whether it's AMD or whether it's Intel, you can do in IA that functionality, and you can keep up with any of it. Darn near real time, except for remember that slide back there earlier when I pointed out to oh, and there's just the ASIC thing, and you do the RAM stuff. There's that looks a lot DSP-ish, but now what we're doing is we're dealing with things that are in the in the gigahertz range. And we're, we're actually handling signal processing out there up on those devices. And that kind of looks like a. Hey, no, 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 no. No, no, no. That's a different question as well. But then we also are in the 5G space. We have this thing that we call. If you look at in the 5G algorithm, we'll see in a second. Um, there's, a, there's a forward error correction code that takes place between the DU and the CU. And that's actually IEEE 16 bit integer math. And we actually now have. Um, uh, we've got some parallel registers, 512-bit architecture parallel registers in the heavy metal side of things, and we break that up into 32 16-bit registers, and we can do all that IEEE math on a 16-bit integer in one tick of the clock, only on 32 of those at the time, we use that in our CUs. That's a special chip, and it's because we took some things out. I have a question back here. Um, so let me try to answer that question this way. 
I'm not an expert on GPUs. And the NVIDIA architecture fundamentally looks like a GPU, graphical processor unit, if you would, if we could call it that, and not a CPU. I'm a, I'm a CPU guy. Except for the fact that I will tell you what, what you can do with a GPU. And, and because of the NVIDIA GPUs, I, I mentioned, I mentioned like you heard me say 64 cores or whatever it happens. Soon we're going to be, yeah, this is public. Um, soon we're going to be announcing a CPU that has up to 100, or, uh, 144 on that, on that 18 um, angstrom. And when we get to that 20 angstrom, uh, 288 cores, cores themselves inside a CPU on a single chip. Um, if you look at the NVIDIA GPUs themselves, GPUs are simply um, are simpler architecture. So for the same amount of surface area, you can get a thousand or two thousand GPUs into that into that space because they're simpler, and and that simpler lends itself that architecture itself. So you can get more of them in there, but the way they're interconnected allows the. If you look at what artificial intelligence is today, it's mostly neural networks. It, it, particularly on the inferencing side of things. The training is a little bit different, but what happens when you're applying that is typically a neural network. And the neural network architecture itself has lots of these nodes that do multiplies and accumulates in some sense. You know, they're, they're, they're simple filters, if you will, but they're all interconnected across. And having, having a, very large, a very large number of those, I mentioned 70 billion nodes in some of these architectures, lends themselves. So if you take, um, if you take current architecture, so set the 144 side, 56, cores themselves that we've got, and you can add, you know, multiples of those into an architecture, you're still in that handful of hundreds of things versus thousands and thousands of them. They've at least got an order of magnitude, sometimes 20 times, sometimes 200 times advantage in that neural network architecture when you start pushing things through. So that's the fundamental reason that GPUs look like they're better is because of the neural networks and all the nodes that are in there as data flows through it themselves. And I will tell you, you can, well, you can do, AI, you know, I mentioned the NPU. We're starting to put that in our AI PCs. It, they're not, it's not designed to compete against um, a data center that's going to have hundreds of GPUs in it. It's designed to allow you to do, you know, a certain model size, you know, at, at the edge itself. And another question, yeah. That's okay. I know I talk fast and sometimes I, Abstract things quickly. So, um, yeah. So, so, so there, so there, so there, so there, there are a couple. There are a couple of things there. The substrate itself, that we start with, is is still silicon, today, right? And we have these people that are out in Intel now. If you're if you're setting stuff up into space, you want that to start with gallium arsenide, by the way, right? Um, and, and there's another gallium or something like that. Gallium. gallium, yeah, right. So so you you, you kind of want to do that, and the reason for that is because of what happens with cosmic rays. You can get fit flips and all that sort of stuff, and silicon is very susceptible. But I said there's a lot of redundancy built into our devices. I I glossed over an awful lot of stuff that's in there. Some of the redundancy is because of that. Let me start getting clear. Memory registers, cancer and registers. A lot of redundancy that is built into AMO for that. And that's for us to come into play. Um, but, but there are technologies that are coming along. Um, I mentioned that Moore's Law isn't dead until we've exhausted the periodic table, right? Um, and I made a little joke about staying away from the nuclear reactive stuff. So we're going to do that. But yeah, there's work going on. Uh, we know that, that in order, we really do. We know that in order to get it out there as far as we really want to get to, at some point silicon may look like your grandfather's semiconductor, but I don't know when or where that is. It's it's a long way. And we're not going to get to the point that we're sending the same stuff into space, I don't think, as we're as we're manufacturing for terrestrial usage either though. And and that's not a technical problem. That's probably more of an economic problem. Yes, ma'am. I did not. Yeah, carving it out. Yeah, what yeah. we used to call right. PSG right. and now back to Altera. Um, and we bought Altera and we could sit at 2015 or something like that. Were you with them? Are you with them now? Or? No, you weren't. Oh. Ah, yeah, so um, I don't know how these decisions get made. Sometimes I think that there's just a dark work somewhere. It's like, oh, you know, no, I'm kidding. Um, 
from a, from a business standpoint, what makes sense is, is life out putting more air in the balloon. Yeah. Right? So, so our balloon is this big and you push more air into it. You want to find out what you pump into it and go, we know enough about our industry and that industry knows about. So the acquisition makes sense. Um, and, and yet at the same time, because of what I spoke to about the investment, how much it costs us to build a factory. So Intel did less than $70 billion last year in total revenue. And if we're spending $20 billion a year to build these factories, we've got less than $50 billion left to run our business. So we've got to find money, to be honest with you, to pay for these factories. And one of the ways of doing that is looking at our business themselves. I mean, since we had them for seven or eight years, we looked at it and said, you know what? It's more autonomous than we thought. And it actually has greater value being separate than, than it did being deeply embedded, again, for a variety of complex consumption reasons. So, so we're not going to sell the whole thing, as far as I know. But we're going to spin it off and it's going to be separate, you know. So FPGAs, you know, programmable um, data arrays, are really pretty cool in that they set, um, they, they set sort of with what put in a variety of worlds, if you think. And in the sense, when I was talking about the 16-bit um, um, map that takes place between the CU and the DU, um, three years ago, to solve that problem, we were using FPGAs because they were a really good solution for that. Why? Because I can make a 16-bit integer register on an FPGA very effectively. I'm, I can make lots of them if I have that in there. Now all I need to do is put that FPGA in the right path of the data itself. So we're putting it down on network interface cards, right? So the traffic that was coming in between the CUs and DUs was coming in off of the network chip, going straight to an FPGA, it would do the FPC kind of stuff. And then if it is, fix it, fix it, and then send things up. Now there's some other stuff in there. Good fit, you still have to do the act afterwards. And then we took and we made that into ASIC because we found that uh, we call those smart hands. And I jokingly said it's kind of like having a smart toddler. You need to make them intelligent. There's a lot of effort that went into making this FDGA intelligent. And we found that on our side of things, we're consuming a lot of software resources and money out of it. So we want somebody else to write the code to make the FDGA as well. But you can't just take the same code, fortunately, from a C compiler and make it on an FDGA. It's a little more specialized than that. And I don't know if that answers your question, but that's where we are. Okay. So I had some more slides, but I'm almost out of time. I don't want to go through all of those. So we're still working on one slide. It is not dead. I've said three times now. Three times. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I'm happy to take any more questions. I'm happy to stick around. Yeah. It's like, what's the state of your. No offense. Yeah, but no. So, so I will. I, I I will say this. We're working on that. We look at it in in a couple of different ways. There's there's the GPUs that go onto the light rock, and I'm not a I'm not a light rock guy, so I don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. I think it only pays some attention. But the GPUs that compete into the deep data centers themselves. Um, there's this thing coming up called Gaudi Three. Uh, I'm not a gaming guy, so I don't know. I don't care. Thanks for the question. Yeah. A former Intel intern, by the way, he started his career even before he had a bachelor's in engineering. Well, his the previous CEO was a was a um, was a uh, CFO that was taught by uh, um, Andy. Um, the blues in Texas is the guy that drove the bus with me there, Jack Welch. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah. Sorry to say that. <laughs> True, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what's your question? Um, what footprint do you think? So, in, in, in that five nodes in four years, that's 10 years worth of work. You really see engineers. Well, don't be an engineer. Go do that engineering thing. That's the biggest change. It's cultural. I mean, you know, lots of other things, but it's mostly cultural. You re energize the engineering thing. And I, I can't really emphasize that. Jim, you have a question? Yeah. Everybody got out of the bathroom. Yeah. 
So you do a lot of things that you say. Yeah. Intel and TSMC. You know, TSMC. You, you guys know the story about that, right? The guy who started TSMC, you know where he came from? Yeah. You know, you know what business plan you put together at TI? <laughs> TI shot him down. They weren't interested in it. Can't make any money there. <laughs> it's on the forehead. <laughs> it seems nobody, unless you're just the one company that that that's all you do to make money from fast. It takes ten billion dollars to build right. one, Jim, in four four or five years. It's a that's a big nut. <laughs> you don't start this in your garage. <laughs> and I, I guess Intel was able to do this strictly because we were so successful in the computer business. We, we used to we used to we used to make a lot of money. Go go back, you know, pre Y two K, and we were making seventy percent margin. Yeah, yeah, that's that's spinning out a lot of cash. You can build a lot of factories when you're making seventy percent margin. We aren't out, you know. Uh, but yeah, what are what are they building in uh, Sherman? What's that project? TI. Isn't that a federal project as well? Is there more than TI involved? Um, I think they're getting some chip stack money, or they will be getting some chip stack money. I think that's. Samsung is building one in Austin. Do what? Yeah, I think they're getting some some local deferment from the school district or the state. That's what I was thinking. I think it was more of an international or at least a national project. I don't know if it's international. I know Samsung's building a factory down. I know that was down in Austin right now. Yeah, um, and that's pretty sad. For those of you that are that are in this field and want to go into that. You know, we've got TI here, great company, great career opportunity. Samsung down in Austin. Intel has a big office down in Austin. If you want to build the A6 and do stuff out in the RAND, um, that Austin is the place to be. Um, and if you really want to move to Ohio, talk to me. Definitely. Okay. Okay. okay, good. I like to play golf and scuba dive. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. I was just wondering. So, so first of all, you got to move twice the amount of data. Yeah. Right. So you, you, you got, you know, we're still 16 bit registers to the outside world. So you've got to get all that into into those five volt registers. Yeah. Okay. And, then, like, uh, and then the second is that because it's so much bigger it uses a whole lot more energy and because it uses a whole lot more energy remember what i said is the the problem is heat right so um what we do is we have to slow the clock down we have to slow the clock down so on five hundred we're working on fixing one but still yeah that's what happens and by the way danny and i used to work on machines with uh 1972 parallel processors, 1900, no, 1792, 1792. So we got along with ABX 512's got one more tick to go before even Danny and I were working 40 years ago. Yes, sir. If we're coming to follow you, you said some of that fun of the. Yeah. 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 You can see that I said you need to take out that piece. So you can put the follow me at the end. Well, there's, there's still layers that are in the middle where we're. Well, I think I'm those dummy layers that we're pulling heat out. Of. Yeah. But again, you got to you got to be able to absorb the heat, and then you got to pull it out, right? So we're absorbing the heat from those dummy layers, and we're pulling them. Yeah. So the power feed itself can be inserted. I think we're gonna have a good metal <coughs> connection to pull it out. So are they using are using soft for on the using, are, we, are they using rocks in the polygon? Um, well, I don't know where we're running Fox. I really don't. Yeah, but we do it. carry a lot of signal in there, so Fox is signal in some sense. Yeah. Last question. Okay, last question. Moore's law. Not dead yet. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not dead yet. I'm feeling better. Thin 2x. I I had thought that the 2x. Oh, yeah. Are you still saying Moore's law at two x is still there? I am not saying that. Okay. What I'm saying is we still continue to try 
gets up. In the, it, it, it's not a physical law. Let, let's be let's be clear about it. Right? It's not even a mathematical law. It, it, it's our motivational fault. It just happens to have the word law. <laughs> so it's kind of like the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. Great. Thank you, Larry.